Okay, behind us is probably the most unique locomotive here in the museum, even more than the 833 steam engine. There are only two of these locomotives that still exist, and one's here and one's at the Illinois Railroad Museum back in Union, Illinois, about 70 miles northwest of Chicago. If you're ever back there, it is definitely a museum worth visiting. If you love trolley cars, they have operating trolleys and full-size diesel and steam-powered trains most weekends. This is a Union Pacific gas turbine locomotive. There were three different versions of these engines built starting in 1952. These original ones were single unit and they were 4,500 horsepower. That was a lot in a day when a diesel was only 1,500 horsepower. In 1958, the General Electric Company, who built all of UP's gas turbines, introduced this, the ultimate big blow as they call them, kind of a parody on the name Big Boy from UP's largest steam engines. These were 8,500 horsepower and later up to 10,000 horsepower, starting in 1961 when the last ones were delivered. They still remain today the world's most powerful single locomotives. Now, I have to explain what I mean by a single locomotive. When you look down along the side, it looks like the old style diesels with a cab unit or what they called an A unit right here, then a cabless booster or B unit behind it, and then there's a steam locomotive style tender. The reason I say this is a single locomotive is you couldn't operate any of these independent because it was all part of one huge engine and different components were in different units of it. The lead unit only has a small 850 horsepower diesel motor for moving it around the yards when the big turbine is shut down. The jet engine's in the B unit and the tender carries the 32,000 gallons of Bunker C fuel oil used by the voracious appetite of the big jet engine that generated electricity. Like a diesel, it's an electric locomotive. Unlike a diesel, it doesn't use a diesel motor to generate electricity. It uses a jet engine, a gas turbine. These were unique to Union Pacific. They operated from Salt Lake, primarily out of Ogden, they would occasionally go to Salt Lake, all the way to the east end of the railroad at Council Bluffs, Iowa. This locomotive put out 212,000 pounds of tractive effort when diesel locomotives put out about 35,000. So one of these would do the work of five or six of those GP9s we saw over there, which was the standard freight engine of 1958. Now the UP had 30 of these engines. They put some serious money into these. Those GP9s cost around 200,000 an engine back in 1958. These engines cost $845,000 an engine. But they could do the work of many diesels. A turbine on straight and level track, if the couplers could handle the, the, the stress, could theoretically pull a freight train 750 cars long. That's about six and a half miles in that era. Now once you got much above 200 cars, the coupler knuckle, the moving part, would snap right through this much steel. It couldn't take the weight. But that was the theoretical capability of the engine. They had a very unique sound to them. Anybody who lived in Washington Terrace in Ogden between the years 1952 and 1969 will remember turbines well. They broke dishes, they cracked plaster, they resulted in more they resulted in more PR complaints to UP in the entire history of the railroad in, in the state of Utah because what would happen is, remember the old roundhouse used to be there where the front runner flyover is? They would bring a turbine out of the roundhouse, they'd fire up the jet sometimes shooting a 12-foot flame out the exhaust. <laughs> then they'd take it down the far end of Riverdale Yard and park and wait for a freight train to come in off the causeway from the Southern Pacific. They'd pull through the main yard down past 31st Street. They would go on down to Riverdale Yard, take the SP diesel engines off, stick the turbine on, change crews, and off they'd go. This happened until they parked a couple of turbines underneath Riverdale Road overpass and they melted the pavement off the overpass. <laughs> After that, and all the complaints about the broken dishes and plaster, the UP would run them down there with their diesel and didn't fire up the jet until the train finally arrived from the west. But when these engines would come into the town, they sounded like they were going full tilt because there was no idle on them. 
you either shut down or go on at full throttle on the jet engine. You could not shut it down to a lower speed given the nature of turbine technology at the time. So they would make a sound that sounded a little bit like a jet airplane or gravel going down a metal chute. It was a low pitch, not a high pitch whine like jets sometimes make. It was a low roar, like a like that. And you could hear them for miles. Anyway, these were the last streamlined freight locomotives ever built in the United States. Everything after the last turbine came out in 61 was built with a short nose, the, the hood type road switcher body to it. But these were fully enclosed because you didn't try to switch with a gas turbine out on the main line. They simply hauled mass amounts of freight from point A to point B. Now let's walk back along the side of the engine out here on the paper. Was the turbine more fuel efficient? No, but fuel was a lot cheaper back then. It was, ah. a, it was a combination of jet engine technology getting bounced to death inside a locomotive, mm -hmm. and then the high fuel consumption mm -hmm. that ultimately killed these locomotives. And diesel electrics by 1969 were 6,600 horsepower. The Centennial Ooh. locomotives are what replaced these. Mm. We've got both pipes here at the museum. Now let's stop right here. The actual jet engine was right behind these big doors right here. Mm -hmm. The grill work you see up there, that was a part of the air intake. And one of the problems with turbine technology, I mean jet engines are a lot more robust today than they were back in the late 50s. They were very delicate. Dust and dirt and grit and birds and whatever would do a lot of damage to them. The problem was you were sucking in all that dust and dirt crossing the wilds of Wyoming or out in Nebraska and occasionally you'd have a, what would they call the catastrophic failure of a turbine blade where the turbine blade would come right through the side of the engine and go several hundred nice. feet out into the countryside <laughs> the, along the tracks. Plus in the winter you had another problem. One of our volunteers here at the museum, who has since passed on, used to be a conductor for the Union Pacific. And he related stories about going across Wyoming when you would have big snow drifts out there. You know, the snow is always drifting in Wyoming. That's why there's snow fences along both Interstate 80 and the railroad. They'd go into a snow bank, big long drift at 60 miles an hour with a freight train, and they'd throw a huge gob of snow up over the top of the engine, and it would almost always land on top of the B unit, and you'd have a flame out with your turbine. So you'd be dead in the water out there in the middle of all that snow because your turbine just got suffocated by a big mass of snow. Likewise, the turbines, this was a great locomotive for Wyoming because you had the wide open spaces. You could have never run an engine like this to all the tunnels and snow sheds on Donner Pass in California in the Cascade Mountains of Oregon. That's why other railroads did not adopt the technology. But there was one place in Wyoming that had a real problem, and that's the tunnels just southeast of Evanston, Wyoming, the Altamont and Aspen Tunnels, which are 5,000 and 6,000 feet long, respectively. Turbines would often suck all the air right out of those tunnels and flame out in the tunnel. So what the UP started doing by the mid-1960s, they modified most of these engines so they could put three or four diesel engines behind them, and therefore they'd have not just 10,000 horsepower, but sometimes 20,000 or more to keep freight trains moving that compete with trucks on the interstate. But the diesels were insurance. If the turbine flamed out, the diesels would get the train out of the tunnel, and then they could go through a restart process on the turbine once they had the air or in the case of a snow bank, once they got the snow melted out of the burner cans and the compressor on the jet engine. <laughs> there were a lot of interesting things relative to running trains with turbines. The railroad nickname, now the official nickname was Big Blow. The unofficial nickname was Bird Cooker. I'll show you why in a moment. Let's go down here. This is the actual exhaust of the jet engine, six feet in diameter. And it came out not as hot as you might think. I'm, I'm trying to remember, about eight or 900 degrees, enough to burn the underpasses or overpasses down at Riverdale Road, but the exhaust would shoot out at a 45 degree angle. That's why the tender had to be modified with sloping ends. You didn't want a flat surface, it would melt it away, it would burn it up. 
And so that held the bunker C fuel oil for the jet engine. It would shoot out and it would give a kind of a thin black cloud of smoke. It wasn't thick like steam engine smoke, but it looked a little bit like diesel smoke, only a little bit thicker. I remember as a, as a kid and a teenager driving across Wyoming with my parents, and you could see these little puffs of black smoke five, ten miles away. You knew a turbine was coming on a freight train. And it would shoot out like that, but the problem was it would kill anything flying below about 300 feet. So buzzards, eagles, you know, pigeons, you name it. If it was flying along and a turbine went under it, they'd just wilt and drop because it would cook them right in flight. Wow. And the, the old joke was, reading the bird took her name came from, that none of the stations between here and Omaha had any pigeons in the rafters after they started running gas turbine locomotives. So, <laughs> but it was quite impressive. Now the tender itself is not, was not built new for the locomotive. The original turbines used to carry their fuel internally underneath and up in tanks in the body of the engine, but they only had enough fuel to get like from here to Green River. UP didn't want to have to take the time to fill these engines up in route. So these engines came out as the last steam engines were being retired. They took the tenders off some of their Challenger steam engines and they rebuilt them to not have a water compartment or a coal compartment, just a fuel oil compartment. If you look closely, Notice the line of rivets that goes across and then angles up. That's where the water part of the tender used to be. Everything else was, was either coal or fuel oil. Now, they, what they did, they took the tender, they put a lot of thick insulation in it because you had to keep that fuel oil above 185 degrees or it wouldn't flow. So they had electric elements in the tender that actually heated the fuel. And that's what those circular plates are. They're the access ports to maintain those. Now, we have a slight interruption here. We've got the Brigham City local headed back to Brigham City behind two SD40-2 engines that were built back in the 1970s. The SD40-2 is the most mass-produced diesel engine in the Western Hemisphere. Over 4,000 were built between 1972 and 1984. Most production ended in 1979. But that was the main freight locomotive of the Union Pacific in the 1970s and 80s, clear into the 90s when they started getting newer engines like the Rio Grande locomotive down here, the Heritage engine. Now, back to the turbines. These tenders still have the old Buckeye-style wheel set underneath them. They're not that different from a steam tender except in what they carried and having the heating elements and all the insulation. 32,000 gallons of Bunker C fuel oil would allow this engine to pull a loaded freight train from here to Council Bluffs, Iowa, and then another train back to North Platte, Nebraska on one tank of fuel. So that meant they could maintain faster schedules, which in the face of truck competition on federal highways was a must back in the 1960s. The last of these locomotives ran on December 26, 1969, as the Centennial diesel engines replaced them. The Centennials, in turn, were replaced by more conventional engines like the SD40-2 in the early 80s, and then they, in turn, were replaced by the third-generation diesels like the SD70 ACE, which still operate today. So locomotives are generational. The lifespan of a diesel locomotive is generally 15 years, though some of the times really good ones like those will last 30 or more with proper maintenance and periodic upgrades. The reason I know that's the Brigham City train, notice all the cars are scrap. The Brigham City local takes the scrap cars to Brigham City, where another local originates going out to Newcore Steel up near Plymouth. Electric uh, steel mill where they make new steel out of scrap. These three locomotives I have a personal interest in because I got these two for the museum and I was the one who got the museum going after the turbine back in 1982. This locomotive here was the first of Southern Pacific's 356 model SD45s. It was a revolutionary freight diesel in 1966 when it came out. 3,600 horsepower. This was the engine that replaced all the old streamliner diesels of the 1950s on the run from here over Donner Pass to California. This locomotive was the last intact 
unrepainted and unrenumbered Denver and Rio Grande freight locomotive left in operation. It was donated to the museum a little over a year ago. It's a special tunnel motor diesel. It's a more modern version of the SD45. It's a little less powerful, 3,000, not 3,600, but about the same size and same pulling ability. The SD45 was a great engine, but it had one problem. It tended to suck in its own hot exhaust gas from the top of the tunnel into the radiator, so there were big flared radiators back along the side of the engine. In 1972, Southern Pacific and General Motors introduced the tunnel type diesel. You'll notice if you look along the catwalk, you'll see a radiator grill down low where the cooler air would be at the bottom of a tunnel away from the hot exhaust gas on the top. Only U Southern Pacific and Rio Grande bought these engines new because both of them had a lot of tunnels and snow sheds in the mountains. So it worked out good for them. Other railroads out in the Great Plains, the Union Pacific and Wyoming didn't need that type of engine. They both have snowplow pilots. This engine was delivered on August 4th, 1966. This one in 1975. Both built by the Electromotive Division of General Motors. Each has a 4,000 gallon fuel capacity. This engine has a V16 prime mover. This one has a V20. Now, when you think about the size of the motors, remember the engine, the motor itself, the prime mover weighs about 18 tons, and each cylinder was 645 cubic inches. Whoa. I have a friend who used to be a mechanic for Union Pacific, and one time I was at their big diesel shop in Salt Lake, which is now the front runner shop there at Warm Springs, and he literally came crawling out of the cylinder on a General Electric locomotive motive and said, hey Dan, come here. And he showed me the next cylinder in line had a crack in it big enough to put a quarter in that had run from LA all the way to Salt Lake on a freight train spewing oil and fuel out through that crack. But the engine still ran. They're remarkably resilient. Still right over here. Okay, now we're in between a standard Union Pacific passenger steam engine of the 1940s and the world's largest diesel-electric locomotive. These are the Centennials. The first one was number 6900, and it was rushed to completion by General Motors, who could be here in Ogden, on display on May the 10th, 1969, the Golden Spike Centennial. This engine was built in 1943. It's one of the last of the UP's new steam engines. It was used to haul high-speed freight trains and passenger trains on the UP system. It ran until the late 50s. This engine here weighs about 430 tons. This one weighs 270 tons. Steam engines were a lot heavier. You had a lot of heavy metal parts. I mean, imagine what this the main driver here weighs. It's 80 inches high, meaning the engine could operate up to 100 miles an hour, slightly beyond. The Centennials were the fastest geared freight locomotives ever. They were geared for a passenger train speed of 90 miles an hour, whereas SD45s, the tunnel motors, were generally geared for a top speed of 65 or 70. This is the locomotive. There were 47 of them built. They cost $545,000 per engine. They're 98 feet 5 inches long. That's longer than from home plate to first base and baseball. They have an 8,200 gallon self-sealing fuel tank. The first locomotive ever built where the fuel tank was designed to be strong enough to support the weight of the engine in the event of a derailment. It had an extra heavy underframe to support all this length, but you notice as the engines age after several million miles of service, notice it's got a little bit of a sag in it. Engines will develop that, even some of the new Amtrak engines have. This locomotive was called a superpower engine. Union Pacific had a fetish for the biggest of everything. <laughs> From the world's biggest steam engine, the big boy, the world's biggest engine of any kind, the big blow, the turbine, to the world's biggest diesel. 
These ran until 1980. They were put in storage in Las Vegas. Then they were moved down to Yermo, near Barstow, yeah. keep them in the desert where they preserve them. And half the fleet was brought back into service for about a year and a half in 1984 and 85. And that was the last normal operation. Like, just as UP has the sister engine of this engine still running in their historic locomotive fleet based in Cheyenne, they also have number 69, 36 of the Centennials. The, the superpowered diesels were designed to replace the gas turbines and be a somewhat more conventional locomotive. This engine has two V16 motors, each 3,300 horsepower. Total horsepower rating 6,600. One of them was actually modified by changing the fuel rack to 7,200 horsepower in a test in 1980, or 1970 rather. But that was only done temporarily. They kept them at the rated 6,600. Two of these could outpull one gas turbine at a much lower cost. These became the mainstay of UP's hot intermodal trains full of conta ocean containers and piggyback trailers right up until the newer engines replaced them at the end of the 1970s. Now earlier I talked about dynamic braking. The big main grills are the cooling radiator, just like on the SD45. They didn't go through a lot of tunnels, they didn't have to worry about sucking cold air in. There's your dynamic brake blister right there and the other one down at the other end on the flared part. Has vertical fins. If you look closely, it looks like an electric toaster inside because that's what it's modeled after. <laughs> Here's how dynamic braking works. On dynamic braking, you've got an electric motor on each axle. When you're going down the track, You've got your big V16s running a main generator right at each end of the diesel motor supplying 600 volt electricity to the electric motors making the train go. But what happens when you come down Weber Canyon and Echo Canyon? Gravity's making the train go. You don't need to feed it any power. But because it's an electric motor, what happens if you put a crank on an electric motor and you crank it manually? It generates electricity. Motors become generators. So in the early days, General Motors and General Electric realized they could harness this to hold trains back on grades without using the brakes that had to be cooled every now and again. So what they would do is you revert, you throw a switch up in the cab in the control stand, it reverses the polarity of the electric motors. Gravity's making them turn, so now they've turned from motors consuming energy to generators producing energy. If you were an electric train, you'd feed that energy back in the overhead wires and power another train coming up the other side of the same mountain. On a diesel, you don't have anywhere to, to put it. So you get rid of it as heat by these electric grids, just like an electric toaster. And that causes the traction motors to make a howling sound, which is what we heard on that freight train coming in. Dynamic braking was one of the reasons diesels replaced steam. That, more fuel efficient and not needing water. Because freight trains always had to stop at Echo to cool their wheels with steam engines. Diesels would bring them right down from Evanston in two hours. No problem. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, it was limited to certain lines that didn't have as tight a curve because yeah. of the distance of the drum side. Well, the wheel sets were really big, plus the extreme weight. You wouldn't run one of these on the old Park City branch or out the new course steel at Milan, I'll guarantee you. You'd turn the rail right over. You had to run them on mainline rail that was heavy enough.